12.30. Good afternoon for distinguished guests. I prepare something. Here we are. Welcome on this Friday afternoon. Welcome to our lunch lecture with Louis Gordon, Decolonizing Philosophy, Decolonizing Theory. This event has brought you to us, and this event is brought to you by the Nanomag Institute for European Studies. My name is Clement Zedmark, and I serve as director of this institute. The Nanomag Institute for European Studies, founded 30 years ago, is blessed with a community of faculty fellows. We are also blessed with a strategic plan that invites us to think about peripheries and European studies and the big questions around Europe today, including aspects of colonialism and the dynamics of peripheralization. The blessing of our community of fellows and the blessing of our strategic plan came together in a suggestion by my esteemed colleague Meredith Chesson from the Anthropology Department why don't we start an initiative in decolonizing scholarship? So here we are. We owe a lot to Abby Lewis, who has taken the project into her very able hands. Thank you, Abby. As always, we also owe a lot to Becca Prince, uh, humbly carrying chairs here in the back, who organizes our events so gracefully. And this is the beginning of a series. We have organized the speaker series for the spring and the fall, where we look at this question from different angles and disciplinary perspectives. What does it mean to decolonize philosophy, theology, cultural studies, anthropology, political science? Decolonizing is an intentional effort to rethink thinking, to unlearn learning, to create new practices. We plan to have some deep conversations that will hopefully inform our practices as well. Three weeks from today, Carlos Mendoza Alvarez will give a lunch lecture on decolonizing scholarship in theology. At the end of March, Laurent Dubois will address decolonizing scholarship in French and Francophone studies. And on April 14, Marisol Lebrun will talk about decolonizing scholarship in feminist studies, critical race, and ethnic studies. These three lectures will have to live up to the high bar set by today's event. Today's event will have a great speaker and a great person introducing the speaker and moderating the Q&A. The one to introduce our guest of honor will be my dear colleague, Corey Garibaldi, Assistant Professor of American Studies here in Notre Dame. Corey is a historian who is interested in histories of citizenship, imperialism, culture and economic thought, the African diaspora, and looking at Europe through the lens of peripheries, colonization and decolonization. Thank you, Corey, for introducing Luis. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Lewis Gordon, the professor and head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Connecticut at Storrs. Um, also the honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies, the honorary professor in the unit for the humanities at Rhodes University, in South Africa and distinguished scholar at the most honorable P.J. Patterson Center for African-Caribbean Advocacy at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He co-edits co the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, the Roman and Littlefield book series Global Criti Critical Caribbean Thought, and the Rutledge India book series Academics, Politics, and Society in the Post-COVID World. He is an author of many books, including most recently Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, uh, published with Rutledge in 2021, and Fear of a Black Consciousness, published um, in hardcover and far, with Farrah Strauss in 2022, and in the UK with London Penguin Books in 2021. And also as a Macmillan audiobook, with German translations and Portuguese translations that I will not try to pronounce. <laughs> Um, in 2022, he's the recipient of the Eminent Scholar Award from, uh, from the Global Development Studies Division of the International Studies Association. Gordon is a public intellectual, an academic, and a musician as well. He's taught across the globe in countries ranging from Australia to Brazil to France to Jamaica to South Africa to the United States uh, to, the, to the United Kingdom and to the United States. He's the uh, um, in addition to the many books he has published, he's also won an award from, another award from the Gustavus Myers Award for Outstanding Work on Human Rights and the Eminent Scholar Award from the International Studies Association. Please welcome me in welcoming Mr. Gordon. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So my mic is on. <laughs> so thank you, Corey, and also Clements, and many of you in the community here. I begin with uh, uh, Hotep, uh, Shalom, Assalamu Alaikum. I could add Ujambo. I could add Domelenga. Domelenga, by the way, is Swana. This one I'm wearing was given to me by the uh, great philosopher Mboho More, who is uh, from the Swana community in South Africa. But you could also say uh, Saubona, which is what the Zulus say, and it's rather interesting. It's interesting the ways we say hello. Uh, I had the good pleasure of speaking with Peter Boyle to say Jejewich. Uh So we began to talk about our uh, Irish ancestry and all kinds of other cool things we love about Ireland. And Saubona is rather interesting because in Saubona, you're saying, I see you. Right. It's interesting. What happened to the world where people meet and like, yo, peace? <laughs> you know, what's going on, right? But of course, if you're in the wilderness and another human being says, I see you, you're like, oh. right. Sometimes it's wonderful to be seen. We could add there, of course, sometimes you say, good day, bonjour. Or if you're bonjour, bonjour, you could go through many others, buenos dias. But also if you're in Jamaican, if you're a Jamaican and you're in Jamaican, you could say, well, go on. Monsieur Yuna. So, to all of you, thank you first for the wonderful, I've only been here since yesterday. I've been to you know, this institution before uh, about, wow, I can't believe it. Uh, 33 years ago, and I've been a few times actually, but it's just been 20 years since I've been here. And it's wonderful to be back. Additionally, it's just wonderful to meet so many just joyous people. So, to get to things, because we only have a short time together, some people are curious why I always talk with my shoes off. Uh, I talk with my shoes off because, for several reasons. And one of the things you're going to see as a theme of my lecture is we often want one reason, but we can think through several reasons. The first one is that speaking is an obligation before a community to speak truthfully. It's about truth. And truth is sacred. And so if one is in the sacred, one commits an act of humility. And so one is on the ground, and one can connect to the land in a sacred way. Okay. The other thing is to connect to the sacred is to connect to the ancestors. And this is something very crucial because you see, we're living in times right now where a lot of people don't take, I mean, they go to ancestors.com and that stuff, but they don't really understand the obligations of what it is to take on the value of becoming an ancestor. It means there should be descendants. And descendants, not just biological descendants, teachers our ancestors. Students can be descendants. When you write, you write to humanity. They can be descendants. So there's a connection when you connect to the people. Who are, there's an obligation to come before a community. But as we know, the world can be endangered by people who have no fidelity to ancestors and don't care about the future, about descendants. And man, how can you reason with such people? Because from their point of view, if there are no ancestors and no descendants, you know what they consider their own deaths? The end of the world. Unfortunately, we're living in times right now where there are people who are trying to rule the world with no sense of obligation to those to come and those who preceded us. Now, the topic I'm speaking about takes many forms. But I'll begin with an allegory and then a demonstration, and then we get into some of that reputed the academic stuff. In my recent book, I tell a story. The story takes place on a Caribbean island. There's a little boy who's late for school, and um, we're in a Catholic context here, and it was interesting. When I was coming, I had a wonderful conversation with a former Catholic school principal. Uh, there's something, this is a little aside though, there's something that's not often talked about, but um, 
although we're talking about colonization, there is a complex history of Catholic schools in decolonization practices. And that's because with the British Empire, a lot of Catholic institutions functioned <laughs> oppositionally. And that's why it's no accident across the global south. A lot of the revolutionaries you meet, a lot of the people who are freedom fighters, turned out to have gone to Catholic schools. Okay? So we're having this conversation. But this context is with an Anglican school. It took place in Trinidad. So there's a little boy who was late for school. And it just so happens that day that a minister to evaluate Anglican schools was sent to that school. And so as he arrived, and the little boy arrived at the gate, the minister wanted to make sure that the little boy was getting the benefits of an excellent colonial education. So he stopped the boy, he was about 11 years old. And he says, young man, and the little boy stopped and said, yes, sir. He said, could you tell me who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And the little boy, you, know, you could imagine the situation, knew exactly what to say. He said, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so the minister was outraged. She said, who's your teacher? And the little boy he says, my teacher's Mr. Smith, sir. So he grabs the boy and goes to Mr. Smith. Now, you could imagine who Mr. Smith was. A person who is also part of the whole colonial situation, probably had many canings, all kinds of things, worked his way through, got his way to become the headmaster of this school, is trying to make sure the other children from the community is able to get the benefits of an education, everything. So Mr. Smith has gone through a lot to get where he is. So he went to Mr. Smith and he said, are you Mr. Smith? I am Mr. Smith, sir. I just asked this young man who knocked down the walls of Jericho, and you know what he told me? What did he tell you, sir? He said he didn't do it. So Mr. Smith looks at the little frightened little boy. He looks at the minister, takes off his glasses, and he says, well, sir, I've known this boy for a long time. If he said he didn't do it, <laughs> he didn't do it. <laughs> Now, of course, this is a story of miscommunication. <laughs> and whenever you say colonialism, just like if you say sexism or racism, try as you may, you're often in situations of miscommunication. OK? And I could say to you up front, just right away, right away, that part of the task of scholarship is to clarify to connect to truth, to, in other words, to find a way to respond, to clarify, to deal with miscommunication, OK? And one of the reasons I'm here to speak, even though I put philosophy in the title, I put philosophy, but you notice I put theory afterwards. So I could say outright, from the beginning of this lecture, I am not a philosophy nationalist, all right? There is a form of nation statism in disciplines. Okay? And they put disciplines, disciplines are imperiled by that problem. Okay? But I bring up philosophy because, you know, philosophy has a very peculiar history. When you're a philosopher, people think you're smart. And when people think you're smart, that becomes what's called epistemological capital, <laughs> right? Now, I could tell you, as a person who does philosophy, uh, right away there's a distinction between professional philosophy and philosophy. And most professional philosophy doesn't do philosophy, OK? And I could tell you also that there are a lot of professional philosophers who are not very smart. <laughs> And it's not to be disparaging about them. It's just that we do have a problem when it comes to education. And the problem with education is certification. And part of what a colonial model of education does, and other models that are basically subordinating education, is to make it such that one could be certified despite being uneducated. 
And there are many people who are educated, but not certified. And so when I made that remark, it's to distinguish the two, OK? But if we get into philosophy proper, there are ways we think of philosophy that often misrepresents how to do philosophy. I'll give you an example. Now, some of you may have seen some lectures where I've done that, so you got to keep quiet. But for others who haven't, what I just did was a series of taps, correct? Now, I reveal that I tapped seven twice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You got it? Once I said I tapped seven twice, you heard seven, you heard the tapping in a different way. Something happened to the tapping. And once you say seven, you could do seven broken into four and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Five and two. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. Six and one. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Now, what's interesting, you notice I move my hand the same way. But did you hear something different each time? If you listen to 4, 3, 5, 1, I'm sorry, 5, 2, 6, 1, they're different. And even though I could do 7, I could do 7 in a funky way. Right? There are many ways to play seven. Well, even though this may look like, by the way, for those of you who didn't know anything about music, that was just talking about bars. But, but what I also did in that act was introduce a transcendental argument. That was a philosophical argument. Because when I brought in the numbers, I brought the question of intelligibility to the tapping. And what's, if I had said I was going to do it in advance, many people would now hold back to try to impose upon it. But you notice when it was simply tapping, everybody in the, wor in the room, I mean, if you could hear it, and if you cannot hear, you could see it, it meant we were intersubjectively related. We're part of a common world. You got it? And this is very crucial because there are people who may argue in such a way that it isolates you into yourself. So somebody could say, I heard this, I heard that, I heard, you see what I'm saying? But there are many times in communication, we're part of a world where we actually all hear because the evidence has been made evidential. Evidentiality is community shared. Even when I talked about ancestors in the beginning, that's the world of evidence. Descendants, the world of evidence. Evidence is always in the world of others. Now, I bring this up because the short answer I've already said about truth, about the way the world is out there, this is something people have been struggling with for thousands of years. Indeed, when you think at the moment, because we think of colonization, coloniality, and we're dealing with the traumas of those, we fail sometimes to think that these are also connected to debates that preceded the age of Euro-modern colonialism. There's a re reason Plato, for instance, or Aristocles, that was his actual name, but Platon was his nickname. When he wrote the Republic, it was called the Politeia, but we know it as the Republic, everybody knows one of the most famous allegories, which is the allegory of the cave. And the allegory, of course, you know, you see it, there are people tied up, they're looking at shadows, somebody gets free, and, goes out, sees outside, realizes that these are shadows. And interestingly enough, that individual could have said, I'm free. See y'all. <laughs> right? But this individual goes back down and tries to persuade people to come out. And there are philosophers who have commented on this, but this back and forth to unshackle people. Right? Decolonization is about unshackling. Right? This effort 
some people have described ancient texts called politia as politics. All right? It's not politics the way we think of it today, but it is political in the sense of the life of the polis, the city state, the living together, to have people come out and communicate in a sheer world of truth. So this means then that philosophy in that understanding has a lot to do with reality, okay? Now, unfortunately, there are many professional philosophers who don't like that. In fact, we're living in an age where people don't even like reality. A lot of times I give lectures and I say the word reality, there's always somebody's like, what's up with that, all right? What are you doing about reality? What is reality? There's my reality, your reality. And then you gotta go through this silly thing about how you can go from one person's view in the world to a world of others. However, there are those who are even worse. <clears throat> They function more like the philosopher who gets unshackled, goes up, ascends, and reaches the opening and finds the biggest boulder and put it in front and go back down like one of those comedy shows where the police officer says, nothing to see there, nothing to see, all right? And we get a lot of that. It's actually very popular. There's a whole popular area of philosophy right now of philosophers who try to tell people there's nothing to see, okay? Now, this is the point at which we begin to get into this question of coloniality and decolonization, okay? Because there are certain themes. Because we have a short time, I'm gonna move a little quickly along them, okay? The first thing, of course, is if you're gonna talk about decolonized philosophy or decolonizing theory, or decolonizing any discipline, it's a good idea to talk about what colonizing them is. Right, what coloniality is. And many people, unfortunately, they don't realize the way they talk about, the very way they talk about colonization and coloniality may be a colonial way because they're already presuming those practices as the only way to talk about those issues. So I'm gonna just give some examples and I hope they're illuminating illuminating, and we can build from there, okay? So, so one of the first things, because I mean, there's a complex history about what we call colonialism, and the roots of the word is linked all the way to farming and all of that, where you have colonies, you know, plant and all of that, set up roots, agriculture, all that stuff. We already know that before the age we call the Euro-modern age, there were empires, there were all of those things, right? So when we're talking about, what we have to understand is when we are talking about coloniality and colonialism, we're talking about a very specific kind. We're talking about the kind in the Euro-modern age. And the reason is because there are all kinds of other things that happened in the Euro-modern age that makes the colonialism we talk about different from the past. This is not about which is better or worse. This is just about different, okay? Now, if you're gonna colonize at all, the first thing you have to bear in mind is that the people who are in the role of colonizers, if you were to go and look at history, they didn't know what they were doing. We often have very simple-minded ways of looking at colonizers and colonized. But sometimes people just popped up in places and patterns start and one day they'd walk around and suddenly there's, there are massacres and all kinds of things going on. That wasn't their original intent, so to speak, okay? The other thing that's very tricky, once it started, is that if you have a set of values you bring to a moment of what's called war or conquest, those values will accompany you. The people we're talking about, when we talk about Euro-modern colonialism, for instance, were people who were part of a long conflict with the Islamic world and trying to retrieve what they call Christendom under the reconquest. And within Christendom and the theology around it, there was a view of what's called theonaturalism. And theonaturalism is when one, one looks at nature as infused by actions of God, okay? 
Today, many people talk about, they, they oppose the natural to the theological. They oppose religion to science, etc. But what they fail to understand is, in a world where God is real, then the real is that which emanates from God. And thus, you study the natural in a different way, because the unnatural becomes that which deviates from God. You see what I'm saying? So it's an error to look at those theologically and religiously oriented people as locked in the supernatural, etc. There was a, just a naturalness. But the other thing to bear in mind is if you have a thing called theodicy, and again, um, one, one advantage, uh, speaking at a place like here, many of you may be familiar with theodicy, but I shouldn't be presumptuous, so I'll give you a short, a short version. Theodicy, some of you may have had a theodician argument with your parent, right? The the at some point, a theodician argument is pretty much like this. Hey, mom, hey, dad. Um, if there's a God, why is there so much evil and injustice? You know, why terrible things happen to good people? And your parents usually give two answers. They're theodician answers. Theodician answer number one goes all the way back to St. Augustine and many others. Who are you to question God? You're finite. God is infinite. You, God knows what God is doing. Who are you, child? Right? So there's nothing wrong with God, something wrong with you. Then there's a second answer. Well, you know, God is so loving and good that God gave human beings free will. And you know what human beings did with that free will? Screwed it up. Now, both formulations leave God intact. We won't get into the fallacies of these arguments, just for now, right? But they lead to a kind of argument that if you find yourself in a conflict with the Islamic world, in which you, bless you, constructed Jews and Moors, Afro-Muslims, as outside of the sight of God, then wherever you show up and others suffer, it works within your theodicy and your theology. Even if an entire population of people die out, it is ultimately connected to God's will. You see? Now, that's very important, because that's different from the way other people who may have found themselves in those situations. You also have a situation in saying, well, maybe God wants you to do this. So the people, when we're talking about Euro-modern colonialism, were people who didn't even know that they were going through the process to create what we even call Europe. They saw themselves as Christian now. And at first, they saw themselves in ways that are different from we see ourselves today. They were actually multiracial populations. But they didn't have race the way we think of it. And they thought of race more in theo-naturalistic religious terms. But it eventually became secularized, etc. But the other thing about those people is not only did they have this view of theodicy, which means that ultimately the, 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 the negative things on others was justified through the positive things on them, but they had mixtures of other things. For instance, suddenly, People who thought they were just going and settling up in places were returning extraordinarily wealthy. And so eventually, Euro-modern capitalism and a bunch of other isms began to form, OK? Now, I bring this up mainly because, as I outline the, colonial, the colonization of knowledge, a lot of this will make things begin to make sense. Because you see, if you're going to depend simply on brute force, to dominate a people, you're going to lose. You're just going to lose. <clears throat> you know, it's not just there. All over the world, we've seen this. We've seen it in the Vietnam War. We're seeing it right now as things play out in Ukraine. We see it all over the world. Because the amount of resources you would have to use to hold people on a sword or gun, et cetera, would completely deplete the resources of your own country. It's far more efficient for people to come to believe they should, that you should dominate them.
In other words, for them to believe that you have a right to dominate them. You should dominate them because you're better than them, you're smarter than them. The list goes on and on. And that is the kind of colonization we're talking about. The colonization where the actual implementation and the ongoing maintenance of it is also done by the people who are colonized. But there's also another element to take very seriously. Precisely because the people who are conducting the colonization have to convince themselves of those lies, colonialism produce systems of lies. The fundamental point is that those are things that are not true. Think about it. If, if those things that we inherit were true, then a lot of the things that we're fighting to transform the world with, we should give up. We should accept the idea of the inferiority of dark peoples. We should accept the idea that women can never be equal to men. We can have a long list that the poor deserve their poverty. All of these things we'd have to accept. But we know those things are false. So why is the world organized around those things? So the first part then is that we have the capacity to make ourselves believe things that we did not, and sometimes at a subconscious level, do not believe. I call that bad faith, okay? And we live, we can live in systems of falsehoods while simultaneously the evidence is showing otherwise. So, this is often called colonization of the mind, but there's a lot more going on. So I'm gonna outline very quickly examples of this. The first form of epistemic or knowledge-based colonialism is basically consent co connected to the view that the inequalities, the disparities right, that we have are not only fundamentally correct, but also the past must be the way it's presented by the false presentation of the past. Many people believe, for instance, that the way we talk about women today is the way the people anatomically we call women have always been. That's false. Many people believe, for instance, that uh, no philosophy began until a group of people, you know, in uh, Athens and other parts of the Ionian states began to do this. Now, now that one always bugged me out. It's just really, really weird. Because think about this. Our species has been around, I mean, there are hominins before us, but Homo sapiens have been around around 300,000 years. They're hanging out in Africa all this time, right? All this time. And what are we supposedly doing in Africa? And the answer is this. And this supposedly goes on for 200,000 plus years. <laughs> and then, you know, about, you reach around the 297 you know, year point, and somebody says, you know, let us step on what will in the future be Europe. And the moment that toenail hits what is the future called Europe, it's like, you know, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. <laughs> I wow, wow, you know, what are the forms? Wow, we should think. And they're like, thank God that is over. All that time in Africa. But you know, if you really think about the way we teach about our intellectual history, it's pretty much that story. And people start saying nonsense like Greek miracle. Now, it's one thing to point out that those things is those, those ideas are false. But simply saying it is not really good, all right? It's a better idea, for instance, to teach through having people learn it for themselves. So to give you an example, when I teach my ancient class, in fact, when I teach even my contemporary ones, I always begin with a paragraph from an ancient philosopher, sometimes a woman, sometimes a man, and I often put the date. 
So for instance, in some of the writings I've shared, I shared a writing by a philosopher named Antef. And Antef was reflecting on philosophy. What's the meaning of it? What it makes me do? The struggles with ideas? All of this, OK? But then you see the date. This was an East African philosopher. And the date was 1900 BCE. I needn't say any more. Because every one of you have been taught that philosophy began about 2,500 years ago in the Greek world. Now, my point when I say this is not to say first must be better or any of that. My point is just that it's a false statement. So how did we come to believe something that is false? Even when the people, the ancient Greek philosophers we read, they don't claim that they created philosophy. You see? You notice I brought up Plato. Plato was dealing with similar problems about truth. But if we don't have to, we could have a parcha. We could go all the way back. And I had a wonderful conversation this morning with Raleigh where we were talking about an ancient person that many people don't talk about as a philosopher, Nefertiti. But I explained her emanation theory of reality, et cetera. Well, the short answer is a lot of these things are easy to find. But if you're convinced that they could not have existed, if they must not be so, you don't take the time to look them up. You see? It's just like we don't think about, if we presume only men think in the past, then we don't look for the women who were thinking. And in fact, in some cases, we do even worse. We find the work that was written by a woman, and we put the authorship to a man because we can't believe it was a woman. You see? And that happens. This happens with lots of other things. There are some people we remember as white who were not white at all. And there are people who, we, you know, the list is long. So what is connected there? Well, part of it is connected to the first form of epistemic colonization. And the one that we're in is called Eurocentrism. And Eurocentrism is very funny for a, a, a I mean it in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of ironic way, because Europe's not even a continent. Europe is a construction that emerged from people in what's today the British Isles, uh, starting first to think of the mainland. That's a continent. But they had no idea that if you start walking over in what is today Normandy and keep going east, you'll end up in what would be China or go a little around Korea. So there's Asia, the continent. But Christendom made a shift in such a way that a concept of a place where the people who became white are supposed to be, and again, I already mentioned, there was never, ever a history of a monoracial population there. So this is a construction. And the people who are supposed to be Asiatic would be to the east. And so this created this notion in which then we have all kinds of absurd things, like ideas begin in the east but maturing in the west. That is part of Eurocentrism. And what Eurocentrism does is exactly like when I talked about colonialism, the colonizer and the colonized. It's not just that it convinces people of the false belief that ideas began in Europe, but it also it convinces people who are now called Europeans of the false belief that ideas began in Europe. You see? Human beings develop ideas everywhere, but part of a colonial logic is to say there's something intrinsic to one set of people that they're the source of ideas. And we see it arrogantly pushed around the world when people said, well, look at the values of rights and universals, and all kinds of other things from Europe. But that's not historically correct. Even certain ideas, right? But, but the point here is now not to say what we call Europeans must now be brought into interrogation, you know, dehumanize. No. The argument is that if we're dealing with a decolonial process, it has to connect to truth. And this 
first kind of colonization of knowledge is not just about Eurocentrism. It's also about other concepts, such as origins. Because what happens is Euromodern colonialism also created the racialization of knowledge. And if you racialize knowledge, then what you begin to say is that if it is knowledge, it had to have been born from a person designated as what we call European or white. You see? And this is one of the reasons why our history gets so skewed. Because we almost, in fact, there are people who even wrote that history didn't even begin until Europeans began to think history. You see? And it's not just about history. It's a whole bunch of other categories. So if we start with this first one, we begin to see that uh, even, the, even the idea of origins, there are a lot of theological concepts imposed onto origins. One of them, for instance, is purity. There are still people who believe methodologically you begin with the pure, and then you work your way out to find the impure. But it's never been reality. It's never been what people are. Today, what we understand is origins tend to be places of diversity, maximum diversity. And what is actually a deviation is the search for purity, because you have to eliminate as much reality as possible to find the pure. But there are other examples that we could think through from this first one, because this first one leads to the second one, the coloniality of the norms of producing knowledge. And the coloniality of the norms of producing knowledge tend to take forms methodologically, for instance, not only the search for purity, but it also takes other forms. A good example is what we could call the commodification of knowledge. The commodification of knowledge is that knowledge can only be valuable if it's marketable. And the market commodification of knowledge may work with a notion of marketability that's not the way historically human communities had plural markets. It could be based on the idea of the reductive notion of markets to business or capital where ultimately whoever can sell it a certain way prevails. But many people don't really understand that at that point. That means that the truth is irrelevant. Reality becomes irrelevant. It becomes the sales pitch that dominates. And that commodification of knowledge example, when it's about the business of knowledge, is also a form of what I call the market colonization of knowledge, OK? But there are many other kinds. There are ethnic, racial kinds, but also in the norms. Think about, for instance, when people think of knowledge production as a fight, right? I can beat you in an argument. But what everybody knows in this room is that winning a fight doesn't mean you're right. right. You could win the fight and be wrong. There are other ways to produce knowledge in which you present something that's accountable. And that tends to be community-oriented, evidentially-oriented, and is what people ultimately begin to understand. In other words, part of the practice of knowledge is not about who wins or who loses, but part of the norms of knowledge is to make things appear that we failed to see before. Hear what we failed to hear before. Understand what we failed to understand before. There is, at the heart of knowledge production, in other words, a pedagogical element. And in fact, scholarship is different if we think of a scholar as an ongoing student of reality. Right? Because it means everybody can learn from one another. It means that there is not the person who is like, I don't know why they do it, but superheroes like to put their hands on their hips. <laughs> but if they're like, I am the knowledge, don't need anybody. But there are other things philosophically that comes in with this. For instance, if you inherit a kind of metaphysics that's called substance metaphysics, then you believe something can be real completely by itself. 
But that is actually, that is absolutely flawed. Every evidence we're having in science shows that is false. Yet that has dominated a lot of what we call Western philosophy and a lot of what we misunderstand about science. What we understand is that everything is interrelated and that thing is actually more a metaphor so you could focus on a particular relation. In fact, even ourselves, we're not things, we're relationships. And if we understand relationships, that means we have to see how a relationship enables another relationship to occur. You see? But if you think in terms of substance by itself, now you have a conception even of a human being that's an individual who doesn't need anybody else. And then you begin to think in all kinds of weird logics that create certain ways of ultimately separating people and taking the human being out of relations. And this is part of what one of the lies of colonialism, the idea of the non-relational human being. Right? The non-relation, I'm a human being absolutely by myself, nobody else. Now, to my knowledge, none of you all were born an adult. It's not like you were squeezed out of your mother's womb and you're like, your job is done. I am by myself, I will deal with the world. It doesn't work that way. Every bit of what we are is the ongoing relationship with one another and in it we constitute knowledge. So that's the second one, the coloniality of norms. There's a long list of stuff, concepts we have. We're sold a bag of goods. One of, among them is Hobbesianism. Hobbesianism really has, treats us like we're these billiard balls colliding with other billiard balls and we're all by ourselves and everybody else is like your enemy and even a conception of knowledge is coercive. If that were really true, many of you all wouldn't even be here right now. None of you would. Every one of you are able to get, in fact, our species wouldn't even be here right now. Because our species is a species that has learned to communicate and work with one another and is spending a lot of time on a lot more important things. Yes, there are people who become self-serving, malignantly narcissistic, etc., but they're not the norm, you see? So you get now into the third one, disciplinary decadence. Disciplinary decadence is a concept from a book I wrote called Disciplinary Decadence. <laughs> but I also talk, but talked about it, I talk a lot about it in a book called Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization. But the idea for it actually came in 1995 in a book I wrote called Fanon, The Crisis of European Man. It's just that, you know when you introduce a theory, you don't really realize its implications? So it took me 11 years later to write the book Disciplinary Decadence because I said, right? It started out of me realizing there was a debate between uh, Henry Louis Gates, a literary theorist, and Cedric Robinson, a political scientist. And I noticed in the debate, it was a lot like that story in Trinidad I began with. Because Henry Louis Gates was criticizing Frantz Fanon for not ultimately acting like a literary textualist. <laughs> and Cedric Robinson was criticizing Henry Louis Gates for not acting like a political scientist. Now, you all know this, right? You have all met people in other disciplines who criticize you for not doing their discipline. Right? It's sociologists who criticize historians for not being sociological, historians who criticize literary theorists for not being historical, literary theorists who criticize you know, economists for not being textual, right? biologists who criticize <coughs> physicists, right? for not doing it in a biological way or in chemistry. And you know philosophers. Got to criticize everybody <laughs> for not being philosophical. That's why I had to open and say I'm not a philosophy nationalist. I don't accept the thesis that philosophy has the, the answer to everything. I think there are many ways to find answers, and philosophy is part of that conversation. OK? And so that's a form of decadence. And the reason it's a form of decadence is because you treat the discipline as if it were created by God. Which would be pretty cool. I mean, if God created a discipline, <laughs> yo, if God were like, here's the discipline. Then think about it. All you got to do is apply the discipline, because it's perfect. But the problem here is disciplines are created by people. 
you see the theodicy coming back. And people are imperfect. And we develop methods that are an expression of our limitations. But if we fetishize the methods, we treat our methods as if they're created by God. We treat, in fact, it's so bad that in much of the professional academic world, you may work your butt off to understand something, a problem, get it published in a journal, and all some people want to know are two things. What is the tier of the journal? <laughs> and second, what was your method? They don't read it. They don't know. You, you could have made up, comp in fact, there are some recent studies of looking at some of the most influential studies where people went back and tried to repeat and find out they were wrong. It's just that they were appealing to the fallacy of the authority. And a lot of people, this is a kind of, this is a decade. They thought the method was there, the journal was there, it must be right. OK? And in my writings, what I, there are many other examples of this. It's the ontologizing of a discipline. Now, some people may say the solution is interdisciplinarity, right? But that doesn't work if each discipline treats itself as complete. Then it's like ships passing in the night. Transdisciplinarity requires communicating with one another. And that's because the energy spent into looking at a particular dimension of reality would be useful for people looking into another dimension of reality. And if they communicate, they may create something new. In fact, contemporary genetics is a great example of this. Contemporary genetics is actually a transdisciplinary practice. It brings in semiology. It brings in elements of biology. It has biology in there. But it also takes all kinds of other concepts from geography to other things as drift. Right? And once we begin, even with science, there are people who still think when they think physics, they don't even realize they think it in a Newtonian way. But a relational way of thinking about physics goes outside of that narrow conception. And similarly, if we talk about decolonization, a lot of people still work with the logic of contraries, what is absolutely universal versus what is absolutely not in the universal. But that's not the human world. In fact, most of colonialism is to create segregated, separate environments. So, what is the solution there? Well, the short solution is exactly the way I talked about communication. It's dialectical. In other words, whenever human beings step out of contraries, communicating makes us realize that the contrary, the absolute universal, was false. You got it? Now, it's not to say that there aren't any universals, but that should come out of communicating rather than presupposed before testing it. You see? I call that a teleological suspension of disciplinarity. In philosophy, it means you should be willing to go beyond philosophy for the sake of reality. And there's a big mistake, and I'm going to finish because I know it, we're, we're running out of time. The big mistake that many people make <clears throat> is that when we talk about reality, we don't realize we sneak in an effort to colonize reality by thinking of reality as a thing instead of a relationship. The Japanese philosopher Kaiji Nishitani put it beautifully, elegantly. He said the problem he has with Western philosophy is that it tends to cover reality with ontology. Many people think saying something is ontological means, gotcha, it's real. And Nishitani says no. What ontology does is talk about being. But who says reality is exclusively about being? And once he challenges this, we, when we begin to understand, it's not that there aren't legitimate debates in ontology. It's just that when we make it just like disciplines reach beyond its scope, we commit disciplinary decadence. And so this teleological suspension, the purposeful suspension, is to reach for reality because it may also generate new disciplines. So this is not even an argument against disciplines. This is an argument about a healthy humility within disciplines. And that humility is a decolonizing practice. You see? So although there are other things that we could talk about, we come to the last one. 
Because you see, all of these are about power. But a mistake we make is we have inherited a very negative way to talk about power. Most people talk about power in Hobbesian coercive models. But power is a fundamental feature of human reality. If all power means is the ability to make things happen with access to the conditions of doing so. If we didn't have any power, none of you could have got up this morning. If you didn't have abilities and the conditions, whether they're cars, steps, food, etc., you wouldn't be able to do anything. And when you now go back to what colonialism is, colonialism is ultimately the use of power for the disempowering of people that not only leads to oppression, but it also leads to a false understanding of reality. That means if one is going to go through the teleological suspension practice, the decolonizing practice, how are you going to change the world if you're going to abdicate power? It means power has to be generated for unlocking what blocks the, poten blocks the potential of people. And that means it empowers them to participate. Look at it this way. If I rely exclusively on my body, then my power is only what I could physically reach. Right? If I want water, I could physically drink water. But because we have created technologies that transcend our bodies, language is a technology, ideas, we have material forms. They, what's recording this lecture now means that I don't have to be where another human being encounters this conversation. And in fact, we create society, rules and regulations that enable people to be in South Bend, Indiana, who might be affecting the lives of people in Tokyo or in Dakar. That is extraordinary. In fact, we have found a way to be communicating in some way with an impact in other planets. This is a different understanding of power. And that means that if we're talking about decolonization, we're also talking about a positive element what Catherine Walsh talks about decoloniality for. And the for element, that brings out the constructive capacities of our humanity. I'll close by just, because of the context I'm in, illustrating this through two models of love. OK? I think Mary Shelley did a great job of talking about this, but that's a whole other lecture. One model of love is malignant narcissistic love. Malignant narcissistic love says, I love you. You say, why? Because you're like me. And I love me. <laughs> so all you can be in that model is an analog of the self. That is the colonial model. All colonialism forces them on other people to become the image of the colonizer. But as you saw in Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, when Victor looked at the creature, the creature was the expression of Victor. And he recoiled. He did not like what he saw. A lot of the suffering from these things is from malignant, narcissistic models of love. And colonizers are always saying, I'm trying to develop you. I'm trying to make you better. But how do they define it? To make you like me. But then there's another model of love called radical love. And every one of you have this capacity. That is where you love another so much that you want that other's freedom. That you don't. In fact, it would be a travesty if there were a duplication of you. In fact, you cultivate their capacity to be creative, do things. In fact, one of the goals of education is not for you to become the duplicate of your teachers is for you to transcend your teachers and to begin to build something that is actually livable for future humanity. And if you go back to my point about power, negative power would be the use 
of institutions to cut off people's options and capacity to live livable lives. That's oppression. That's domination. But a positive view of political institutions is that they set the conditions of possibility for people to have options that, are, that, that enable them to make meaningful choices. And when you act politically, it means its reach ultimately reaches those who are anonymous. And think about it. We have the capacity to love those who are not like ourselves. Not only that, we can do it across species. We have the capacity, even when we think theologically, there are conceptions of God that have absolutely no analog with a human being. And so this is part of our creative spirit that is linked into practices of decolonization. And in scholarship, what it means right, is that if we come to theory, decolonizing theory, all the word theory means is to view, theorize. But even that is a conjunction of Hebrew and Greek. Or in Hebrew means light. If you see it, there's no light. If you have your eyes open, there's no light. You don't see anything. Well, part of the decolonization of it is understand that you can't see without meaning. And meaning, linked to muthos, muthos means from the mouth. It's marriage here. When we begin to understand that we need to have sight and meaning meet, then part of decolonization is to deal with a more, more um, broad, affective dimension of human existence. And with that, our scholarship then, attuned to reality, it means that we can draw communicatively on the resources, not simply what we in our discipline offer, but to communicate to wonder what we as a species, and perhaps one day beyond us, can offer for the understanding of what it is to not only learn about reality, but also to live it well. Thank you. student here in the poli -sci department. Um, I have to admit that I'm one of those people who don't like truth, uh, but I think there is hope for me yet because I do like relationality. Um, and I really appreciate you emphasizing that in the end because it is a very difficult task to relate, but it is a worthy task. Um, and as you mentioned, there are many ways of colonizing, there are many ways of decolonizing. Uh, so relation, relating to one another is very important. I'm just curious, what work does leaving the cave do um, in, in relationality? Can we not stay in the cave and have a rich, meaningful conversation um, whilst remaining there? Is it just something that, like, like a motivating thing that spurs you into action? Or is leaving the cave, cave important in itself? <coughs> 
Thank you. Let's hear some, some, from some more people because I think it's important for you to learn from one another, one another the questions you ask. Okay? So I, I have the first. I have a, an unusual ability. I can process many questions. Okay? Without even writing them down. No? no? There was one talk I, I had 75 and answered all of them. So yeah, so we got one. Let's keep going. Ah, over here. And others may not know you, so we met this morning, so say your name for all. It's wonderful hearing you again. I'm Ishika. Uh, my question is more about how the language of decolonization is now being co-opted by the culture of the right and is taken into cultural supremacy, even for those who were previously oppressed. Uh, and I was just wondering, does it become the mandate or the responsibility of those studying and propagating processes of decolonization to kind of reclaim that space because that goes into very dangerous territory? Okay, let's hear from some more. Trust me, your questions are very important, and since it's recorded, it means for those who are looking, you know, viewing it, you know, they could think about what you said. Yes? Thank you again. Uh, so I'm Alpha MJ student, first year. And then um, it's really a lightning talk because in my mind before I came here like colonialism it's related to physical act of colonialism and the act of states against others. So now we have this much more bigger perspective of the colonialism of the mind and then as epistemology itself. My question here is when we are putting together colonialism and decolonialism. So isn't that a limitation itself, the way we think about decolonialism as epistemology? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we could just go straight to those, because I know the time is limited. Um, it, it's funny the word truth, OK? Because um, one, one problem with, with being in uh, Anglophone societies is Anglophone societies, because there's been a period of British imperialism, et cetera, Anglophone societies um, tend to treat their language as if their language is complete. And many people in English don't even realize the word truth has Germanic roots in worth. And the word worth, it means that it actually connects to faith, which is, right? What is worthy of your faith? Okay, so that already, that's very different from some of the more analytical correspondence stuff of truth. And of course, there are other conceptions in Greek, aletheia, for instance, for, which means, of course, that which is disclosed. You notice when I went from the ergonal to the community-oriented way of looking at reality, that was alethic, right? It was disclosed. There are others in the Latin tradition, there's verification, right? But again, and again, that's connected to being to point to, establish, et cetera, right, the veridical. And then if you go into ancient East African language or in Hebrew and others, you'll find all of these interesting elements. So already, even in the concept of truth, the way I talked about transdisciplinarity, there's already a thing going on with language, you see? And part of it is some of those fallacies I talked about with purity and so forth happen with language. A wonderful text, if you're curious about these issues, is by a Ghanaian philosopher by the name of Kwasi Werudu. And he wrote a book called Cultural Universals in Particulars. And, and what's beautiful about the book is, you see, to be a typical West African, just to be an African, typically, you're living in a world of at least five languages. OK? You're living, you're, you know, for some cases, if it's English or French, that's your fourth language. This is the same in a lot of Asian countries and a lot of, and a lot of South American countries, et cetera. OK? Now, people who are multilingual, who grow up learning other languages, know this. But some of you, when you study language, you've, dis you've experienced this too. When one language meets another language, embodied in the individual carrying the culture, they often make the mistake of seeking isomorphism. They treat their language as having completely mapped onto reality, and the other language as completely mapped onto reality, and they just have to peer the terms. But that's absolutely false. Because the historical conditions, the cultural experiences that led to the production of that language 
may have also had ex situations that the people in this language never had. And the same the other way. And something interesting happens when they now reach terms or they're trying to express situations that the person who speaks this language doesn't know, right? There are philosophers who devoted them, their, their time to what they call the indeterminacy of translation. They treat it as if you're now at an impasse, right? You don't understand this. But is that correct? What actually happens when you travel and you learn another language is you don't know what the term at first means, but you practice using it. And one day, you find yourself understanding it. You're like, I get it. The problem now is you meet somebody when you go home, and they say, could you explain that term? And you can't translate it into your original base language. And it goes both ways, right? Now, what, this, what Rurudu pointed out is as long as you learn a language, you have the potential to learn other languages. And because you're now living and communicating with those other people, your epistemic framework has been expanded. This happens not only with languages that are what we call natural, ordinary language. It happens also with systemic languages. I have friends who theorize in 18 dimensions. They give mathematical equations, go back and forth. And they begin to realize that they're communicating in something they can't translate to other people who work mathematically in five or six dimensions. And this already tells you something not only about our brain and cognition, but it also tells you something about meaning. And we already know this. Meaning can grow. We can learn more things. That's why I prefer the model of learning. Okay? So that's connects to the relational part. But it also connects to the idea of, of us now rethinking truth uh, to understand that we're using the word truth in the English language to enter a broader conversation on our relationship to reality main, in which the word truth may be insufficient. You see? If you say ma, which is the root from which you get my eight, or my, people say, well, what the hell is that? That's in the language of Medanetra. But in that language, a, a, an unlivable reality makes no sense. For it to make sense of reality, so the, the term is also normative. And I could go on and on, but I won't get to the other questions if I do. But I write a lot on that concept. But once we, once we begin to understand that, we also have to understand how we talk about oppression, domination, etc. Okay? And yes, there is this problem of commodification and co-option. But the thing to bear in mind, what we forget, is that any concept we introduce is in a world of human beings. You see? And it has to be in such a way that human beings participate in it in order to understand it. One of the things what we have to ask is there's some things the project is overcoming them, not actually fetishizing them. I've often argued, for instance, that oppression is not something that should belong to anybody. Oppression is something that everybody should be trying to get rid of. It's a very different thing. Now, but in order to understand, some people won't enter the discourse very well. But part of it is because, as human beings, they have their imperfections, and some also may have malevolent intent. But the issue becomes not so much whether they get it right. The issue is going to be, is this an important issue to work at for the rest of us to make the world better? And so I have often argued that it becomes a distraction for us to actually be rehearsing the co-option model, because that always happens. In fact. I've had conversations with many of you today where I talked about, for instance, the kind of colonization of the past that rewrites the agents who produce them into the agents who now dominate. We have a word for that. It's called stealing, <laughs> right? But there are certain things people participate in not to steal, but because it's great. Um, nobody, for instance, who loves curries <laughs> 
is trying to say that they are if they love, you know, uh, Jamaican food. They're trying to say they're Jamaican. They're just trying to say it's great. Some people forget that hip hop or dance music, it's fun. And so as we begin to, to, to think about all of those, we need to get to the elements of them that we share, that we can participate in. So together, we could also clearly state when there's abuse, right? For, the, for, for abuse to happen, we have to have the possibility of what non-abuse would look like, which gets to the epistemological question, right? I'm a critic. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm going to end very quickly. Okay, thank you. The error, the short answer is the critique of epistemology is similar to the critique of ontology. It's a mistake to reduce knowledge in which in, 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 into the logic exclusively of an ontology-based knowledge system. There's a longer answer, but I know we're out of time. Okay? So thank you. Thank you.